Welcome to Inclusive Gathering Birmingham. My name is Danielle and my pronouns are she, her. Um, you might have picked up that this week in the UK is Refugee Week. And so there's been hundreds of events celebrating the contributions and the beauty of refugees and asylum seekers around the country. And also recognizing some of the challenges that refugees and asylum seekers face um, in battling systems and, and um, structures that don't always see them as the humans that they are and the contributions that they can make to our life together. Um, and so today we're going to be pausing and looking at, at Refugee Week through um, music and some art and just uh, thinking together about how we celebrate particularly um, LGBTQ refugees and asylum seekers and welcome them in our community. And we're going to be hearing a bit from Journey, uh, asylum seekers group who've been um, actively welcoming LGBTQ plus refugees and asylum seekers and supporting them over the last number of years. We're also going to have some music from the Refugee Week Choir with an original song that's been written from inside one of the detention centers in the UK. Uh, and some music from David Benjamin Blower, who's going to do a few songs from his album called Welcome the Stranger. And also our friend Nicole Grace from Open Table is going to be sharing a song with us today too. Uh, so whether you're gay or straight, whatever your gender identity, wherever you come from, uh, whether you feel you belong here or you're not sure, um, we want to say uh, you're welcome here just as you are and um, kind of join with us on this journey of learning and discovering things together. We're just in the midst of kind of making that weird tr transition from being fully online to starting to have some in-person gatherings. And so we're meeting in person now on the first of each first Sunday of each month, um, as well as live streaming. And then every week we're online like this with um, a little gathering and then a Zoom conversation afterwards. So um, you're welcome to join in as much or as little as you like. We've also got community groups during the week and some special plans for picnics and things during the summer that we'll tell you a little bit more about later. So um, I'm going to hand over now for some music from David Benjamin Blower. This next song is called Welcome the Stranger. It came about when I heard a speech an Easter speech by the then Prime Minister David Cameron who said that this was a Christian country. Um, meanwhile his government were building a wall um, in northern France to keep uh, refugees from crossing the border into the UK. Um, at the same time that everybody was um, poking holes in Donald Trump for building his wall we were quietly building a little wall of our own. Well, there are politicians saying this is a Christian land. And certain newspapers like to wave it around. But if they had any idea what the Bible says, They'd be the first to convert to about anything else. It says to welcome the stranger into your home and care for the foreigners, one of your own. Jesus says he stands before you in this suffering. If you turn away from these, then you turn away from him. Well, I guess we're being generous, believing the best. That our leaders are just ignorant of what the Bible says. But it's all too possible, they know very well. Still, they invoke the name of Jesus as they build the gates of hell. Hello, my name is Dina Nayeri. I am making this video to say a few words about what refuge means to me. Uh, as a refugee, I guess the, in the most literal sense, refuge means uh, freedom from physical harm, from danger, uh, you know, being, I guess, taken away from something, um, I guess, hopeless and terrifying to something 
you know, good, full of possibility. Um, I think for me, the sensation of being granted asylum, that moment of escaping and, and, and coming into a new life actually... Um, was very visceral and it, it felt very much like a big heavy door had been slammed shut on all that was before and that I um, all of that was now inaccessible all of the harmful things all of the scary things um, all of the things that we had been afraid of were no longer accessible and so there was no possibility of my being thrust back there um, and so I could actually let go of a lot of the um, mental crutches and a lot of the the self-protective um, kind of devices I suppose that I had in in my mind. Um, I think, you know, refuge is so much about a, a, a mental place also. And, and I, I'm exploring that actually as I write my next book. But, um, you know, for me, I, I had a lot of little things that I use to protect myself. Um, uh, I, I have a bit of uh, um, OCD and, and I am a very anxious person and my OCD and my anxiety would always ramp up at moments of um, uncertainty in my life. But as soon as I came to the next place and I felt accepted and, and the possibility of a home in front of me, um, those things receded and I was able to come to a place of creative possibility and imagination and I feel um, able to to be a creative being instead of one that simply survives um, and I think that that is um, a much I mean it's 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 a richer existence it's it's the the way I was born you know to exist that's how I want to live um, so that's what refuge makes possible for me there's a moment in Martin Luther King's historic I Have a Dream speech when he turns his attention to white people who, realizing their destiny and that of their black fellow citizens was intertwined, joined the movement for equal rights. He said, they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. So the theme for this year's Refugee Week is taken from these words. As part of our regular worship gathering, we share something called the question for sharing. And that's a moment to give us uh, a little bit of time to hear one of their stories, to connect with one another. When we're in person, we chat with our neighbors. Uh, and when we're online, we share responses to the question in Facebook chat. So the question for today is, can you think of a time when someone has walked with you through a significant moment in your life? Perhaps they help carry a load celebrated a triumph with you, or simply listen to your story. Hi, I'm Debs. So the story I want to share is from when I was about seven years old. Um, and I was a kid who loved to read. I was always in the library. Um, I read everything I could get my hands on. And I was top of the class at reading in school. Um, and that summer, I was looking forward to the school holidays, and I was especially looking forward to it to the end of term because I'd been told I was going to receive a prize for my reading achievements. But then one day when I was bored waiting in line, I noticed uh, a display on the wall which had a, a list with pictures of the books that uh, we'd been set to read for that year. And I realised that there was a whole set of books that I didn't recognise. I hadn't seen them before and I definitely hadn't read them. And for some reason, this began to play on my mind. And the more I thought about it, the bigger uh, a problem it became in my mind. And that night, um, I struggled to get to sleep, thinking about how there must have been uh, a serious mistake and that somehow I might be receiving this prize under false pretenses. And days went by and weeks went by uh, where I was having more and more trouble getting to sleep and imagining scenarios where I would get into trouble, my teacher would get into trouble. So all these kind of scenarios were playing out in my mind and, and making me more and more anxious until I knew that I was going to have to speak to my parents and confess to them what was worrying me. Somehow I plucked up the courage to tell my dad that there was something that I, I needed to speak to him about. But somehow, in that moment that I began to speak to him, it was it was already okay. And so the next day, my dad made a point of walking to school with me and speaking to my teacher um, and making sure that I understood that no one was going to be in trouble. I've never forgotten uh, that feeling at that moment 
the the power of of uh, how a problem can be transformed um, when you just share it with someone and how you can be that person for someone else as well. The Jewish scriptures are in lots of ways the story of God's relationship with the Jewish people and how God related to them and helped to form um, their laws and community based around a, a, a sense of God's justice and how relate to both one another and to, the, to those who are outsiders among them. And so there's a number of different scriptures throughout um, what Christians call the Old Testament um, that relate to welcoming the stranger. So I've just picked one of those to talk about today that in terms of um, Refugee Week, and it's a reminder to us that our faith traditions are built on the idea of radical hospitality to one another and what that can look like. Um, so there's, there's verses like this dotted throughout uh, the Old Testament, but also uh, in the ways that Jesus related to, to folks in, in, the, in the scriptures, the Christian scriptures. So this particular reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 6 to 19. Change your hearts and stop being stubborn. God is the great God, the mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. God ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. God shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. This is a true story about a woman and a husband who, um, after being stuck in a refugee camp in Lebanon for um, an indefinite amount of time, uh, decided to make the trip to Europe if they could. We gathered every penny that we had Threw all our belongings in a bag And we left the chicken wire camp On our way to Europe's shore we walk the soles off of our shoes Hungry, tired, battered and bruised And we joined the traffickers' queues On our way to Europe's shores They crammed us in till we heard the starboard crack and I said, get me the hell off this death trap. But they said, cowards won't be getting their money back. So we stay for your own shoes. Well, the waves were crashing over the deck And we hit a rock and everybody leapt Soon the waters were up to our necks On our way to Europe shores My husband pulled me out of the boat and he gave a drowning lady his life coat And off into the darkness did we float On our way to Europe's shores We swam as best we could north and west Till my husband said he needed rest and his voice drifted off into the darkness Until my ears couldn't hear him anymore
Well, I was pulled onto a boat by a man whose language I couldn't understand. And I stumbled down the plank onto the land, and here I am on your rope shores. This is a prayer from The Dangerous Journey, a litany about migration by Corey Driver. God. Our loving parent and creator of all, your children cry out to you. Those who pass through the waters, those who struggle across the land, God, be with them. God, you carried the Israelites through the heart of the sea. You escorted them across dry land with your fiery presence. God, your word reminds us continually we were strangers in a foreign land. God, help us to have radical empathy for those who are unwelcomed. You told us when we love the stranger, we are, in fact, loving you. Help us to love the stranger, the neighbour. God, creating us a compulsion not to stand idly by. Amen. I'm from Iran. Uh, I got a degree in computer science and I had my own business in Iran. I'm from Syria. I was studying pharmacy and working as a pharmacist assistant. Hi, I'm from Tanzania. I used to be a manager for Intercure Tanzania. Hi, I'm from China. I used to be a teaching assistant. In Bimago, uh, I study English and math. Uh, at Sutton Caulfield and Brass House Colleges and uh, I am also volunteer at Oasis Church and uh, I have a part temporary uh, part-time job in a warehouse. In Birmingham, I'm an entrepreneur. I study healthcare and childcare in Birmingham. I volunteered at Nursery. In Birmingham, I study ESOL and volunteer at Refuge Action and Restore. In the future, I imagine to get my uh, IT degree here and start a job that I have always wished. In the future, I imagine Birmingham as a champion of super diversity. I imagine in the future, I have wonderful time working with the children and my own nursery. In the future, I would imagine to be a qualified pharmacist and work for the NHS. My name is Essa. I'm Faye. My name is Young. My name is Amarjala. So this song is called The Persian Hunger Strike of 2016 and it tells the story of a number of Iranian um, people who were um, living in the refugee camp in Calais, which the Western media called the jungle, um, living there in intolerable conditions, and they decided to go on hunger strike um, to campaign for better conditions for everybody there. from which we ran not so long ago there is a custom there among the people on death row to take a needle and a thread and sew their mouths shut and neither eat nor speak until their time is up because once the verdict's given by the powers that be You ain't no human being and you have no right to speak You 
in the land to which we ran for to save our very lives. We thought that our humanity would there be recognized, but they nailed their borders shut and ignored us from the start. And now we live in squalor in a camp in Northern France. Because once the verdict's given by the powers that be, you ain't no human being and you have no right to speak. On February 29th, it bulldozed half the camp. After running for our lives, we lost what little else we had. And as the children wandered homeless in the wind and rain and mud, we took a needle and a thread and we sewed our mouths shut. Because once the verdict's given by the powers that be, you ain't no human being and you have no right to speak. Hi Daniel, this Hi, is a Phil. really lovely spot, isn't it? It really in, is. In Mosley Park, fantastic. So thanks for joining us, and um, it'd be great to hear a little bit about what you do with the Dirty Asylum Seeker Group, what it is, when it started. And we'll just... Fantastic, yeah. Well, it's been going since about 2014, quite a long time. And it started off, um, a, a local pastor from the Journey Church started it. And we, we were meeting at the Birmingham LGBT Centre once a month. Mm -hmm. And we realised that um, asylum seekers who are LGBT can feel particularly isolated, you know, even amongst other asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. um, so just to get people together and to help them feel that you don't need to be isolated, you can find a new family, a new community, get support, that seemed to be really important. Mm -hmm. And we kind of built on that. Ever, ever since. Uh, and I got involved in about 2016. So there were about 15 people. Now we're up to about 50 or 60 on yes. the books. Uh, and of course, we've been going through the COVID crisis mm. with all its sort of challenges. Um, and I guess everybody's found it hard, haven't they? Uh, but asylum seekers, I mean, just imagine, say, that you're in a family who are putting you up. And then, you know, the um, one of the people in the family is made redundant. So they're short of money and they're trying to support their household and they're worried. Everybody's back at home rather mm. than going out. It's really kind of pressurised, mm. you know. Or you're waiting for your solicitor to reply, but he's no longer in the office. Or you try and contact an agency and they're working from home. Mm. So there's been a lot of waiting, a lot of pressure, a lot of mental health problems. Mm. But people show remarkable resilience mm. in the midst of that. So we've been, you know, working away at trying to help the group in that situation. So we had, you know, WhatsApp group. We had a Zoom meetings. Uh, we've been phoning people up. Uh, we started a buddying scheme mm. for group members. So we would sort of train people up to ring other people during the, uh, the crisis. And that's been quite good. Mm -hmm. um, so people have been kind of contacting each other and gaining confidence uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've linked with mental health agencies, we've had workshops. Um, we were very glad of your help mm -hmm. you know, in the um, inclusive uh, gathering, raising money for us and for your prayers. Mm -hmm. um, so actually things have been developing quite a bit along the way, mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly. And the group continues to grow. You know, even though you think, well, how have they found us yeah. during lockdown? I guess that's kind of like for us that having, being more public in mm. what we're doing, you know, yeah. means that people do do find you. So how are you um, seeing now, like this transition between some of the online relationships and the translating to in-person yeah. relationships? Yeah, well, we've been meeting people on a one-to-one -one basis, came outside mm -hmm. and 
we, we started outside events again. So we had a picnic for about 25 when we could. And that was great because mm. nearly everybody there had never met each other face to face. Yeah. So that was great. It's interesting how many people who've been through quite traumatic experiences, when they've had a chance to sort of come to terms a bit with that and live, live with it, they want to sort of use that to help other people. Mm. So quite a few people talk about what oh, I'd like to be a carer, or I'd like to get into social work. Mm. And obviously we've got a whole range of people. We've got people who've never been to school, mm. and can't read and write, but bring themselves mm -hmm. and their experiences. And we've got other people who've been in quite high powered group, you know, jobs and mm. about making that transition and finding a new niche for themselves. Mm. So, but I guess people bring themselves with all their gifts, their humour, their, their resilience, mm. you know, um, their, 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 their breadth of experience. Um, <clears throat> and they find their way into wherever they can, mm. um, you know, whether it's working in a restaurant or working in the care profession or going off to do a university course. Mm. You know, we've got somebody who's just applied for an engineering course mm. at the university. Um, you know, things like that. So, I mean, they bring all of what they are, what they've brought, to enrich our society. Mm. Um, and maybe also sometimes to help their, their communities in this country who speak their language to think a bit more about things mm. um, um, and to think a bit about issues of sexuality and, and so on. Mm. And we've got people who have got involved in campaigning, things like that. People who've be involved in um, research projects in universities. Mm. But about every week, somebody comes to us and says, "Can we do a research project?" And you think, "Ah, oh, another research project." <laughs> um, but actually, I mean, when people do an hour's interview with somebody, you think, "Please God, may that raise some awareness, mm. you know, somewhere." But I, I love meeting people from all over the world. Yeah. It's such a privilege. Um, and um, yeah, just seeing how people too are beginning to or continuing to engage with questions of faith and sexuality. Mm. And there's a whole variety of responses to that. Mm. Um, but it's interesting how many people in the group, I mean, we, everybody's welcome in the group and our leadership is inclusive. But it's interesting how many people do have some kind of faith mm. and they're saying, well, where can I go now? where I can be, you know, accepted as I am. We want people to feel welcomed and included and celebrated for who they are, wherever they're at on any kind of faith journey and whatever they're working through to bring themselves. So, you know, sometimes I think, you know, I think myself about what the challenges are. What do I need to adapt in order to be more welcoming? Where, you know, we always want to be in that position of learning. So are there things that we can do to yeah, grow in I mean, that? And we're learning all the time. Yeah. Um, I suppose one thing is about language, you know, that for some people the language is quite a barrier. Mm. So maybe having people around in any group who are willing to sort of spend time with individuals mm. at their speed and their pace yeah. um, can be can be quite helpful. I, th I think I think face to face meetings really matter. I mean, we've used Zoom, but it's always second best really. Yeah. And you know, people need to sort of sit down with each other. Mm. Um, we were just talking about the, the experience of maybe people who've been brought up in you know, a very devout Christian family, but where the assumption is that to be gay or lesbian is, is just either demonic or a deliberate perverse choice. Mm. And I, actually, somebody was showing me yesterday an email which showed a picture in the press in a country which just said the family were publicly disowning their child officially mm. from then on. Um, so this is part of the pain and grief that people feel that, that is. with them. Yeah, and, and what's amazing is that people still want to pray, they still want to read their Bibles, uh, but they somehow have got to bring all this stuff together. Mm. Um, and I guess but everybody makes that sort of journey of integration. Yeah. And it's a privilege to be alongside people. Um, and obviously, of course, off, often they're just dealing with the asylum process. Yeah. And until you've done that, you can't really think about other yeah. things. It's so complicated yeah. and long. Yeah. And... yeah. 
I mean, maybe if I could put in a plug about bridge building between mm. churches and our group, we're really looking for new volunteers because some of us are a bit ancient. Who? You know, ah, yeah. I mean, some, somebody <laughs> said to me the other day, "Do you know what? My granddad's old. He's younger than you." Oh. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> but, but um, you know, we do need people who are a bit younger. We need people who are more ethnically diverse. Mm. Um, so we are we are recruiting new volunteers, and and they could be quite useful bridge people as well mm. between the two groups. So you're well. talking about people to you know relationship building or yeah. helping with asylum applications. Yeah, and... yeah, um, helping with our publicity, helping with campaigning, um, just so many things mm. that we could do. Um, yeah. So so we are we are advertising for volunteers. So anybody can yeah. contact me through you. Okay. And and just find out a bit more about what's involved. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And a big thank you for those who've been welcoming in the past. Mm. Those who pray for us, you know, those who are alert to what's going on with the government at the mm. moment and the proposed changes to the asylum system. Yeah. Which I think are a nightmare. Yeah. And, and also just, you know, how we can build bridges and help people to find a place where they can worship yeah. and grow in faith in their own way. Yeah, and be welcome just who they are completely. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Phil. Well, thank you. Good to talk to you. You too. I prefer to die openly as a gay man in UK rather than return back to Malaysia. The Home Office don't believe that I'm a gay man, so they refuse my uh, appeal. In Malaysia, if you are a gay man, you have been illegal, you will be put in prison for 14 years to 20 years, plus whipping in the public. It's so hard to prove it to them, and I told them I'm a gay man, he said you don't have a partner. I'm only 67 years old. I do need sex, so I need support. Uh, I was very depressed when I heard the news and overdrew. So I, I don't know what to do. So I have a suicide thought also. I arrived in Liverpool in uh, 2017. I'm still not openly to myself as a gay man. I don't feel safe, so I still hide it until I get to know the open table in St. Bright Church. So I feel very safe now with all the gay community which I join them. The kind people who love me and they know it's so difficult to come out as a gay man. So now my local uh, social leader is applying for me the fresh claim. So we get all the support letters. I got my local MP to support me. His name is Josh Howard. So he write a letter to the Home of Security. My life is totally changed as a gay man. So I'm very proud to be a gay man now. Hidden. There's never been a moment you are not forgotten, you are not hopeless. Though you've been broken, your innocence stolen, I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear you. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night is true. I will rescue you. 
There is no distance that cannot be covered over and over. You're not defenseless. I'll be a shelter, I'll be your armor. I hear your whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. I hear the whisper underneath your breath. I hear you whisper you have nothing left. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. Hi, Ella. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Great if you could just introduce yourself and a little bit about the song we're going to hear in a moment. Sure. Yeah. So my name's Emma and I work for the charity Hear Me Out. Um, and we are a small charity that works with people inside and outside um, immigration detention centres to release um, their stories and their voices through song and music. Um, and this song was written by um, a group of detainees in Dover Immigration Removal Centre. Uh, it was back in, actually it was back in 2015 um, that it was written. Um, and it was, after speaking to Lamin, one of the one of the people who wrote it, it was very much um, in his opinion, written as a, as a piece to, to uplift people um, and to bring them hope. Watching all the footage coming back through from the choirs, and hearing their reaction to it and, and hearing about how so many choirs practice over Zoom and, you know, they, they use their one rehearsal that they've had but to be able to be together outside for this song. It's just so humbling and touching and, um, yeah, just I was just blown away by the level of support and people's compassion and commitment to to the cause and to, to let those people know that they're not alone and that, that we all stand together. It's, it's hearing it like after, especially after I spoke to Lamming just gave me goosebumps and it still does every time I watch it, I get emotional. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not, I've watched it probably about 35 times now. <laughs> it all just, just shows just such a, a wonderful side of humanity. Great, well, we'll listen to it now. Never give up, 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 never give up
Well, um, Emma, that's a good question. Thank you for asking that one. That's a very good question. Because um, Never Give Up was a song created in the darkest first time, times of my life, you know. And um, um, if you hear the lyrics in the song, it tell you everything, my life from inside and from outside before I came in. And um, so in short, to describe the song, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's about praises and about upliftment, you know. You've watched the video or you've watched the, fir the first cut of the video that, that all the choirs singing together what how did you feel when you were watching that what did you think amazing 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 it was amazing there's I, I don't have words to describe it it's just amazing you know and um seeing everyone involved in the choir singing it and um me watching it you know my son was next to me and we was watching it and he's like oh that is so I'm like <laughs> yes <laughs> they make daddy proud you know it's it's definitely it uplift me and it take me back in the times that I was in my own cell inside writing the lyrics you know so you know i mean it's joy mixed with sadness you know <laughs> really but um it's good to see you guys did a great work with it and i'm really happy to see that you guys keep up the good work you know so thanks for joining us today um if you'd like to catch up with us on zoom at 5 15 we'll be posting the link and we're just going to have a casual kind of catch up today and maybe reflect a bit on some of the themes we talked about. Um, I'm saying goodbye today from uh, Edgebaston Meeting House. Uh, and on the 1st of August, we're gonna be having a picnic and outdoor worship gathering here. It's a beautiful space and it'd be really nice just to have a whole afternoon together to hang out, um, to do some singing. Actually, we're allowed to sing outside and just to have plenty of time to just be social and get to see each other. So um, there's more information about that on our website and on Facebook. And um, it'd just be really great for folks that are maybe a bit further afield to, to come and join us as well if they feel comfortable doing that. Again, there's no pressure to join us um, if you're not feeling ready to do that yet. So I'm just gonna finish with the blessing that we share every week. May we live fully, may we love wastefully, and may we have the courage to be all that God has created us to be. We'll see you next week.